what, what are the basic principles of heat transfer involved here? What kind of heat exchangers should we look at? How should they be piped? Why am I bringing up solids and phthalate? How about the house operation and sequence? How do you control? And let's just take a quick look at this. So what is basic heat transfer is all about? I don't care if you're talking about a cooling coil, a heating coil, chill water, hot water, or a heat exchanger. In this case, we're specifically looking at heat exchangers. You've got this Q BTUs per hour, which is equal to U, or the heat transfer coefficient, times the area times the LMTD. This is kind of like the temperature deferential. We've got the log mean. But that's the formula, if you're a heat transfer engineer, that you have to use. It's the same formula you have to use to calculate cooling load through a wall. It's the same formula. But we're looking at it from the standpoint of heat transfer on a heat exchanger. So what is this U factor all about? This is the this is the U factor that we want to look at real quick, and we're going to pick a heat exchanger. We want the most efficient heat exchanger you can get. We want the highest U factor you can get. The higher the U factor, the smaller the heat exchanger. The lower the first cost, the more efficient it is. What impacts a U factor? We well, got the FEM coefficients, which is, you know, what is on the film of the surface. Do you have uh, turbulence or laminar flow? You got the material resistance. You've got coefficients, and you've got phthalic. You put all this together, you've got some kind of a heat exchanger pattern you're going to come up with. This is a typical plate, and the whole idea behind the plate heat exchanger is high turbulence. Uh, to get the U-factors up, you can get some extremely high U-factors on a plate heat exchanger when you create turbulence with these different types of plate designs. That's the whole concept. So what we're trying to do, specifically with a plate or any heat exchanger, we want to maximize that U factor because it reduces the area down, reduces the first cost down, and makes it affordable. And that's the thing we're looking for is the highest U factor we can possibly get so we can come up with the most economical selection of a heat exchanger. Typical U factor on a plate can be as high as 1,000, and it's not uncommon to see those kind of numbers. But there's another approach available to you on what is not economists. You can go to single pass series counter flow heat exchangers. And we're going to find in a few minutes what single pass counterflow means for all types of heat exchangers. But in essence, you want the coldest water with the coldest on, on each side. And you want to make sure that you've got it single pass counterflow. The advantage of these is they're a lot easier to clean. We'll kind of comment on that as we go. Some changes on, uh, if you haven't looked at heat exchangers lately, whether they're chillers, evaporators, or single pass counterflow like we're talking about, the old designs were just standard copper tubing. The new designs are enhanced tubes. And it's just spiral tubes, very simple. But what you're doing, you're creating some turbulence in there. You get a little more surface area out of it. And you're creating some turbulence to break up the inside film coefficients. You're breaking up the inside film coefficients, which essence increases UU, which means you can get away with more BTUs to smaller surface area. So what does series counter flow mean for enhanced tubes? Or really, play heat exchange is the same story. Uh, you see the U factor impact by going to enhanced tubes. And what you see on the plot on the left hand side is, is a U factor. And what you see on across the bottom is just the flow. But look at the U factors themselves. Typical shelling tubes, a lower number, by enhancing the tubes, and you saw what enhancement means, you can increase the U factors two or three times. So now single pass counter flow heat exchangers become practical on a water side economizer where you want real close approaches. So on a single pass counter flow heat exchanger, four degrees is reasonable. And the reason people are looking at these again is they're cleanable, you can get marine water boxes on them, they're easy to design, and they're very flexible where you put them. So let's go a little bit further with heat transfer. We hear people talking about lambda flow and turbulent flow. We hear people saying pick your coals, always be turbulent. Pretty much a true factor. What do they mean? It's a simple little picture of it, but laminar flow in a tube, a pipe, or a cooling coil, or a heating coil simply means the flow, as you see at the top chart, is just nice and smooth, just going down the pipe nice and easy. There's no turbulence to break up the inside film coefficient. What you want to do at the bottom with that turbulent flow is you want little eddies working along the surface areas of the tubes to break up the film coefficient. Because if you can break up that film coefficient, you can dramatically increase the U factors. Dramatically increase the U factors by having that. 
So what does that mean in temperature cross and approach? Let's take a quick look and try to educate everybody real simple, not trying to make heat transfer experts out of you, but if you're going to do water side economizers, you need to grasp some of this because you have to pipe them accordingly. You put them in, you've got to pipe your plates or your straight tube heat exchangers accordingly. So what is a temperature cross? What does it mean for a plate or a single pass heat exchanger? What is approach? What does it mean? Look, I'm working a cooling tower. I'm trying to make uh, 52 degree water out of 49 degree wet mud. I'm trying to give you 49 degree cooling tower water to the heat exchanger to give you 52 degree water and chill water side. I'm trying to get a tight approach. That would be a three degree approach. So the message is I want to make as cold a water as I possibly can from water side economizer. And the limitation of that is how cold a water can I make from a cooling tower. How cold a water can my cooling tower give me? And how close to that cooling tower temperature can I make water? Can I make chill water using a heat exchanger of some kind? How close? That's the approach. And what we want is the tightest we can get. So what's reasonable? Uh, you can pick plates, but probably two degrees, pretty reasonable, clean. You can pick single pass counter flows probably for four. My chart here shows three. So what does temperature cross mean? Temperature cross means what? Take a look. I got my coldest water on both sides together and my hottest water together. In other words, look at the flow errors. My, I, I, I'm going to operate as a chill water uh, heat exchanger for a second. I got 57 degree T1 return chill water temperature going in my heat exchanger. And going out of my heat exchanger, I've got cooling tower water going out, say, at 52 degrees. Everybody see that? So I got a temperature cross going on. What am I trying to make? I'm trying to make 45 degree water, which is T2. To make 45 degree water, I got to have colder water. Come on, so that's going to be my coldest water for my tower at 42 degrees. I'm making 45 degree leaving water. That's a three degree approach on the 42 degree water I'm making. On the other side, I've got a seven degree temperature cross. In other words, I'm making colder water than I'm taking back out. I'm making what 45 degree water on the on the chill water side. On my condensed water side, I am sending back to the tower 52. You see that? That's a seven degree temperature cross. That is only technically possible single flow counter flow. And you can see the flow errors in different directions. And that's the, what we mean by temperature cross and approach. That's why you've got to have single pass counter flow in order to have a temperature cross. Very simple, but you've got to understand it because when you go to pipe your heat exchangers, wake up. You've got to pipe them accordingly or they won't work. You've got to pipe them up in a temperature cross, single pass counter flow situation, or they won't work. So make sure you understand why this is important. So we've been playing around with plates since 75. They work quite well. We've also been playing around with single tube counter flow heat exchangers for probably 25 or 30 years as well. And they work quite well. Uh, we want to look a little bit real quick, quickly at fouling. And it's a subject that people don't talk about enough. Because, uh, very simple, you're dealing with cooling tower water. And in the air, you've got all kinds of stuff. Why is this important? It's a typical uh, clearance mark with a little red arrow here of a typical plate. As you can see, it's pretty tight, uh, 0.16 inches in on a typical plate heat exchanger. So for all practical purposes, and this is an I&M from plate manufacturers. We went through and looked at a whole bunch of them. And all of them have the same information, identical in I&M. It says, very simple. Uh, we've got thin wall heat exchangers, high heat flows, but it can be seriously reduced if we get deposits. And we're telling you, you've got to do maintenance. If you're going to do maintenance, fine, but you need to have a pretty clean system. You need to do maintenance on the heat exchangers to make sure we don't foul them up. That's just what the IONM is saying. And we find, unfortunately, a lot of heat exchangers on water side economizers that the maintenance people have just simply turned off and bypassed because they're foul, they don't want to do the maintenance. Now, as designers, we want to save the energy. We want to do the right thing here. And the right thing is to get them cleaned up. And that way, we don't turn them off. So what are we getting at? Here, here's what happens when you foul a heat exchanger. This is pretty typical, whether it's a chiller, evaporator, or uh, a plate, or a single pass. Get up, it doesn't matter. As you foul a heat exchanger, your efficiencies go way down. Your power required go way down. In other words, your efficiency of the heat exchanger just deteriorates rapidly. And we obviously want to keep them clean because keeping them clean, we've got that efficiency in place. Prettiest picture, huh? A uh, typical plate that we see sometimes with no 
maintenance being done and no system to keep them clean. If you're going to put in a heat exchanger like this, uh, it's not going to last long. You're not doing your job. Don't get mad at me, but you're really, really not paying attention to the real world. Uh, here's the real world for you. Here's a typical picture of a job site in a couple of cooling towers. Uh, basically, the paving's been done. The general contractor want to turn the building on and dry it out. How many times have we heard that comment? So where do you think all that red clay is going to go if there's any kind of wind going on if we turn on the tower? make a long story short, you see what happens. So the message is anything in the air in a cooling tower is going to wind up in the stump of the tower. And this is to the extreme, I know, but I'm trying to drive a point home to you. Uh, you see what happened to the plates on the job site? They immediately got filed. Uh, so basically, here's a general statement for you. And pretty much ASHRAE pretty much, well, if you dig into it, we kind of make the same kind of comment. It's pretty much essential in every cooling tower operation that you clean it up. That, that, that you've got an open cooling tower, you need either centrifugal separators or sand filters, pick your choice. We don't care, but you need to do the maintenance on those open systems and to keep them clean, and particularly with water side economizers, because if you don't, they're not going to work. So the message of the seminar is if you're going to spend the money, you're going to spend the time to do a water side economizer, which by code you're going to have to do, don't we owe it to the owner? Don't we owe it to, to, to the people involved to make sure they work and their maintenance situations can be handled? Please consider putting separators, sand, centrifugal, whatever you want, to clean those systems up so we don't get problems. Here's a typical example of a little water side uh, uh, cleanup where we're using the basing of the tower, a little sweeper type system to keep it clean. No big deal. Here's what it looks like. We even recommend that you, in your guide specifications on all cooling towers, that you get the factories to install these little uh, piping systems for cleaning in the basins. You don't have to buy the sand filter now. You don't have to buy the centrifugal separator now. But get the sweeper systems in the basings of those towers so when the time comes somebody has a maintenance issue or somebody has the money, don't have the money up front, then go ahead and get this done because this is critical to making these things work. Why would we spend the money if we're not going to make them work? That's kind of the question. So another comment on a single pass heat exchanger, and you may want to take a look at this based on what we're seeing. They do handle fouling better. You can only get about a four degree approach versus the plate at two, but the plates foul a lot quicker, and once you foul a plate, you're going to lose efficiency. You may find that single pass counter flow heat exchangers save you more money and reduce your maintenance costs. It's certainly a good option to take a look at. Let's go back to the water side economizers. What is the design procedure we're going to go through to pick these water side economizers? And this is something every engineer, every designer is going to have to deal with. So why don't we just start taking a quick look at this and try maybe we can get a little guideline how to do it. First of all, you're going to have to calculate your cooling load at 50 degree dry bulb and 45 degree wet bulb for your building. You're going to have to make the decision whether you go series or parallel. We're basically stating that parallel, parallel, for all practical purposes, is dead. Series or integration is the way it's going to go. We need to look at cooling tower piping. We're going to have two pipes out of towers. We're going to have it back. What are we, what are we going to do? Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Somebody's got to make that decision because that decision is critical with head pressure control, critical with having cold water to your water side economizer. Do we have a dedicated cell for the economizer? Your, your decision, but don't ignore it. What is the required chill water supply temperature? Why are we asking that? You got the BTUs. What is the required chill water supply temperature? You got to calculate the approach. Approach of the cooling tower, water coming to your heat exchanger, and temperature you need, because that may size. You got to have that size your heat exchanger, and you're going to have to check your cooling tower size. Will your dedicated cooling tower cell be big enough to cool, provide the BTUs for that building at 50 degree dry bulb and 45 degree wet bulb? And that's where you select your heat exchanger and you've got to double check your cooling tower size. And people are not used to doing that. And what control sequence will we use? Well, given your control sequence, in the essence of the schedule we have for this seminar, we don't really have time to dig through this. This is pretty basic. Uh, what we find, this is being done. This is actual sequence we got from an engineering friend of ours. He's been doing it for years. We have permission to use it and give it to you. It works. 
The interesting thing you should get is this, that on the waterside integration system, he's getting free cooling at very hot temperatures. In other words, he's able to switch it over at 55 degree wet bulb and start getting cooling. He's able to turn it on at 55 degree wet bulb, integrate the water side economizer into his chittle plant and start getting free cooling. Now you might have to adjust that number a little bit based on where you are and what your chill to supply temperatures that you need are, but this sequence works pretty good. It gives you a place to start, take a look at it. This is based on two different temperatures, by the way. Here's a typical water side economizer selection for a heat exchanger, and you see the numbers involved and for a cooling tower, just to give you some numbers. But the message is here, we picked the cooling tower for summertime conditions, but now we got to go over to the wintertime. Got to go to the wintertime and check to see if it's big enough. And this is what we did here. This is one that's been picked for the summertime at 95 degrees. 78 degree wet bulb, we're making 83 degree cold water, 12 degree range, and what we got to do is take the BTUs required for economizer, run over to those temperatures and see what we can make out of it. Pretty simple, but the message is we've got to double check our cooling tower size. We pick it for the summertime condition, yes, but if you're going to have a dedicated cell or however you're going to handle it, you've got to go over and look at that wintertime load condition to see if you can handle it. If not, you may have to actually increase the size of your tower or have more cells dedicated to the water side economizer. Uh, another little quick comment, and I think this drives the point home to you. Go look at your bins. This happens to be uh, Raleigh Durham Airport, but all I'm after is for you to look at temperature bins. And all this is is a chart showing you how many hours out of the year that the wet bulb is below 50 degrees. And in this particular case, you see we started at 49 degree wet bulb, one degree below 50, and we got 3,487 hours that were below 50 degree wet bulb. And when you integrate, we can run this tower 3,400 hours a year at 50 degree wet bulb or below and do some pre-cooling when we integrate the towers. Now, if you were trying to do a quarter water side economizer parallel, You'd have to get a lot colder wet bulb before you turn it on. You have a lot less hours of operation to work with. Another reason for showing you this, if you want to calculate the energy savings available to you, then now you've got a way to get there. You can come here and look at the hours of operation before the wet bulb temperature you turn on your water side economizer. You can match that up with your tower. You can come up with the BTU savings if you've got a cooling load profile for your building that you're getting out of your water side economizer. Might be a great thing to do for lead, great thing to do for calculate and justifying the water side economizer payback. Typical little chart for picking your water side economizer, and we don't have a time to go in detail, we're just giving it to you. If you're interested in taking a look to come up with your payback on your investment. All we're saying is if you go through this procedure, you can come up with the anticipated energy savings for doing a water side economizer. And obviously, integrating them saves a lot more, and it's becoming code, so obviously, it has to be done. It does make sense. Kind of last but not least, as we go through this, I want to go back to what we're seeing in a marketplace with this integration. And what we're seeing is a dedicated sale to the water side economizer. We're seeing heat exchangers in the position of being in series with the chiller plant to where we can pre-cool the 58 degree water going to the chiller plant, the 55, 54, take some load off the chiller plant. And we're seeing a dedicated cell of colder water to the water side economizer, two pipes out to a towers and back, another set of cells to the traditional chiller so they can run at the same time. You can do it any way you want to, but this is what we're seeing. This is kind of probably going to become the design. The message is this way you can maintain your head pressure control, you can keep the temperatures elevated on the chillers that are running, and you can have as cold a water as you need for your water side economizers. So the message real simple is pay attention to this. If you don't want to do this, okay, but you've got to find a way to handle the head pressure control.